All right, that's part one. Okay, part one. All right, so this is what we call the afterburn. Okay, so if you have comments, questions, or thoughts you want to share, or questions you want to ask, etc., about the teaching, you can line up over here because we do have the podium out. If you're online, our Shamish team will take down your comments and questions and then read them over the mic as well. Okay? And we'll begin with Brandy. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. So, I have a couple of questions. you got to put it right sorry, up your mouth. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I have a couple of questions. Um, so Messiah brought, he didn't bring anything new to them. And he was talking to the Jews. So they would have known the context. Because I know you said they use a lot of um, idioms in their time. The first question I know is super simple. And you probably answered it in a teaching that I haven't seen yet. Um, but where he's talking in 25, most of the time there's a lot of references for referencing either the Tanakh or the, you know, the initial books that he gives. But when he's speaking here, I don't have any references. And I was just trying to see if maybe there were some that they would have said, oh, this is what he's saying, where he references the Tanakh. Oh, as far as the parables he gives in Matthew 25? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, every good teacher, okay, is going to reference, you know, the Tanakh if possible. I mean, you know, because that's the Old Testament. I'm going to mention where the foundation is. But at some point, you're also going to give, and I do this often enough, real life metaphors that people can relate to. So they can relate to someone giving them silver to do something with. They can relate to a shepherd dealing with sheep and goats. They can relate to, you know, the, uh, the idea of having a lamp and having oil or not, okay? And so he's simply giving them a life lesson on a mindset problem that the actions were flowing out of a mindset problem, or the actions weren't flowing out properly because it was a mindset problem. So he's not necessarily referencing that way, although we're gonna see that there's clearly a reference to many times the heart that was in the Old Testament when they failed often enough was because of these types of problems. But he's not referencing or referring to anything specific there in these verses, okay? Okay, and then um, where he talks about everlasting life, I was kind of looking at where um, and they're talked about the kingdom of heaven or the reign of heaven is like. And I was just also looking to see where that was in the Tanakh. I found a lot of everlasting covenant. Um, the life part was only like in Daniel 12, 2, where he told them, you know, then to seal it up. Um, okay. Mostly in the Tanakh, you see phrases like prolonging your days, which would have been the same idea. Okay, so your days will be prolonged on the land, or your days will be prolonged. So it's not just instead of dying at 70, you'll die at 80, okay? But it had to do with more the, the kingdom and the everlasting life. So these are those indirect references. In the? In the Tanakh. Right, but so you're talking about like ever, the everlasting life slash kingdom would have been talking about the king. Um, so it would have been talking about the land, okay. like the kingdom. Mm -hmm. It would have been talking about prolonging your days, like everlasting life. Okay. 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 Um, and then 19, what was wrong with them calling him good? No, it was him using the opportunity to define good. Because he was about to teach this young man certain lessons, and he wanted to start off with saying, okay, first of all, there's none good but one, which means that anything that's good, and he said, what good do I have to do? That has to be stuff of Elohim. So don't just call me a good teacher and you're gonna just do whatever I say. You need to know that what I'm saying is Elohim or it's no good. So he was defining a term. It wasn't just saying, I'm not good. He's saying, I'm trying to define something for you so what I say afterwards will make more sense contextually. Okay. Okay. And for that part where he was talking about good and then he went in Luke, he was again giving them character examples. It reminded me of um, Caleb and Joshua. When, it, when you talk about they f being perfect is following him completely. Right. Um, it, is that more of a character reference? Because for them, it was, and a lot of the mentionings in the Tanakh have to do with them following the commands. I didn't, I could, I was trying to connect, but couldn't how Joshua and Caleb's character might have been other than do, obey what I'm saying, telling you to do and trust me. All right. So... Yeshua, I'm not minimizing who he is, okay? But let's just use, him, use this picture for a second. Whoever is anointed, and Yeshua is 
a Mashiach. He's the Mashiach, so he's anointed, okay? That anointed person needs to be trusted as it coming straight from the Father. Mm -hmm. And so Joshua and Caleb trusted Moses just like he was saying to trust, Yeshua was saying, trust me. You see, what I'm saying is that they recognized that Moses was only saying what the Father said. Moses was only sharing what he was told to share. And so Joshua and Caleb trusted what Moses said was coming. So they went out and said, hey, Elohim said this. Moses actually said it, but they believed and they trusted what Moses said. Yeshua was saying the same thing. Come and follow me. Trust in me because I'm doing what the Father says. There's none good but him and everything I do is him. So you follow me, you'll be in good shape. But he's not bringing anything new. So what, everything he's referencing, sh character specifically, should be in the Tanakh, right? Because they would know you're talking to Jews. You're not, you're not, you can't bring me something new because okay, then yeah. you're a false prophet, there's right? Nothing, there's nothing new about what he said because that was the same problem all the way throughout the old. I mean, you're always begging them to follow and listen to him all the time. Well, the problem is why he sent the prophets all the time was they weren't doing it. They were doing master, master, and they were not doing what he said. And that's what Jeremiah said, and Ezekiel said, and Isaiah said, and every other prophet said, is, and Moses even said it, you guys are not listening. The commands, though, right? Yeah. But this, the example here is beyond the commands and what he's saying. Because he's, he's telling them it's talking about their character and doing it from the heart, I guess. No, 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 no. He's, he's saying you can't do my commands if you love your stuff more than you love me because you're going to make decisions wrong. He's also, again, in 25, linking it to the sheep and the goats, which, again, has to do with how you love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. So he's showing that, of course, if you love your stuff and your situation more than you care about other people, you're not going to go do those things because you may have to inconvenience yourself to go take care of somebody else or do something like that. So, yeah, it's a character problem, but it's a character problem that makes, impedes the Torah observance, that makes the Torah observance, you know, fail. <laughs> okay. Okay? Or you fail in your doing it. Okay. Okay. Um, so he's trying to adjust the problem. It's just like the Old Testament says, they, they, you know, they praise me with their lips, but their hearts are not there. Okay. Okay? Okay. It's the same thing as master, master, but you don't do what I say. So it's always a character problem because the mechanics are easy. Okay, for all you Christians out there, I'm going to make this official. You don't have to believe me. There's not a single Torah command that's hard to do. There's nothing that's hard to do. Now, some of it's hard to do challenging-wise because the world makes it hard. In other words, if you want to keep Shabbat and you have a job that normally works on Saturday, that makes it hard for you. But keeping Saturday itself is not hard to do. It's not hard to check labels and make sure you're not eating unclean. It really isn't. It takes a little time to get the habit of it, but it's not hard to do. It's not hard to keep different holidays or holy days than what the world does. It's not really hard to treat people a certain way. Maybe you think it might be hard not to murder somebody because you get, but it really, is it really that hard to control your anger and everything? So what part of Torah is so hard to do? It's a character flaw is why it's hard. When your heart's somewhere else, it's hard. Because if Torah gets in the way of something you want or wants you to do something you don't want, then you got a problem. Torah says you can't eat shrimp. Maybe you love shrimp. So it says you can't, you know, do certain things on Saturday, but you love to do those things, but you can only do them on Saturday. Whatever it is, it's going to challenge you from a character point of view. What do you love more? Okay. One of the biggest challenges is tithing. It's my money. I love my money. I want to do what I want with my money. Well, no, some of it's yours. Some of it's his. It takes a while to wrap our brains around that. If you love him and trust him, then you have no issue understanding that it isn't all yours. Okay, that it's all his, really, and he lets you, you, he lets you, he actually gives you 70%, as opposed to you giving him 30%. 10% first tithe, 10% second, 10 third. You're looking at it wrong. But I did all the work, but he made you. Okay, there wouldn't be any you to do the work if he didn't make you. Does that help? It does. Thank okay. you. Uh, one last question. Um, I, I didn't put the verse down, but in Matthew 19, I think it was, they talked, he talked about the rebirth and judging the 12 tribes. That would surely have a reference, but it wasn't in here. Oh, the rebirth. Okay, so um, there, there is, rebirth is actually in there. You just got to know where to look for it. In the talk? Yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, the idea of the dry bones putting on flesh in Ezekiel 37 okay. is a rebirth. 
okay? So the rebirth meaning that you were dead and now you're alive, okay? And there's lots of references in the prophets to that. Listen to the Discovering Your Identity teaching. I think I covered in part, I can't remember what part it's in, but anyway, listen to that teaching. Years ago, it would have been in part two. Now I don't know where, it, or part three, but I don't know what part it's in now because there's only four parts back then. I have no idea what the number is now, okay? But when we deal with the prophets part, okay, when I start talking about the prophets, you're gonna see lots of places where it talks about basically being dead and, and now being made alive, okay? Or not being a people anymore and now being a people, which is the same idea of a rebirth. And then the okay? same with the judging. Okay, like now as far as the, 12 the authority of what they're gonna have judging, um, that isn't referenced anywhere in the Tanakh, but that's just something he's throwing out there as, just so you know what you're going to do, I've trained you very privately and, and, and personally so that you will have authority and leadership to do these certain roles. Just like Moses, so there's a Tanakh thing, Moses appointed all the people that he appointed to have authority. So Yeshua is appointing who he wants to have authority. Okay? Thank you. So that really would, I guess, have an Old Testament, you know, basis. Remember, the anointed appointed are the ones who appoint. All right, Ali. Shabbat shalom, Rabbi. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, yes, I wanted to talk about gratitude or make a comment about it that, yes, it's exactly as you say, that everything we earn isn't our own. Yahweh just gives it to us, I guess, essentially for our use, and we give a little bit back. And... You touched on the rich man going away sad because he had many possessions, and I want to talk much about the opposite of that, being in the place where you're forced to trust Yahweh for your next morsel of bread, so to speak. Because in that place, your faith, your belief, like you're going to grow from that, as opposed to having like a job that pays very well and that you don't have any worries because you know that... Tomorrow you'll have a job in the morning and you'll be paid well. You can buy anything you want, all your needs and more. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make a comment about that. Okay, Being... hold on. So with that, two things. One, recognize always that when you said it first, recognize that everything comes from him. Deuteronomy 8, when we talk about that's where we get the um, the hafta from. I'm not the bad, the, the uh, 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 Birkat own from, the blessing after the meal. You know, just remember that he says that he's the one that gives you the power to get the wealth. So if you have any abundance at all, he gave you the ability to do that. All right? So that's where, again, you appreciate that it's not just you. You had to still do the work, which is the second thing you were talking about. Yes, when you are broke, and, and wondering where your next meal is going to come from, that takes a lot more faith than when you have abundance, mm -hmm. okay? However, you're not going to get the abundance until you trust that you still have to do your part while trusting. In other words, you're trusting that if you put the effort in and trust him, the effort will bear fruit at some point. You don't just kick back and wait for him to take care of you. So if you have a job that doesn't pay enough, it's never going to pay enough until you make the effort to get a job that pays enough. Okay? And that's really the important thing. Okay, next. Yes, and in being in that position, like, pride, pride ego won't necessarily come, out, come up because you don't have to deal with it. As it says, lest you forget that, I don't know what the scripture verse is, but lest you forget that Yahweh gave you all these things and it wasn't by your power, it was by him and your obedience more specifically. And yes, like the fact that you wake up in the morning is a blessing because Yahweh gave this day to you, this time, your energy, everything for to glorify him, bless him. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that would be just the previous verse, verse 17 versus verse 18. So we're still in Deuteronomy 8 where it talks about that. But the thing is, the thing is again, you know, that appreciation and the attitude as we do our focus from the right place. You know, um, we, we have to recognize our part, and our part also has to do with recognizing his part and trusting that part, but you have to do your part. You have to put in that effort. Look, there's a lot of you out there, I wanna talk about when you mentioned the pride and the ego thing. 
I can't tell you how many times Elder and I, two things come up on a regular basis. One is we hear about you from other people that know you, but you won't come and talk to us because you have a pride issue, okay? We have family members, spouses, friends that will come and say, blah, 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 so-and-so talk to you, and we're like, nope, all right? And it's because you have a pride issue. The second thing that's even more common, well, I shouldn't say more common, at least as common, is that you'll come to us with a financial problem, and then you'll demonstrate very quickly that you actually have a pride and ego problem. We say, well, how come you don't have three jobs? Why aren't you then doing this other thing? That Because it's beneath you. Or you're unemployed for a year, but you don't drive DoorDash, you don't do Lyft, you don't have a McDonald's job, which is, I mean, you could get a job. There is no reason today, even in my whole lifetime I can think of it, there's no reason for you to ever be unemployed. Now, you could certainly be underemployed, but don't tell me you can't find work. There's always work. I mean, to okay. that. So, but the only thing is, is it work you're willing to do? Well, but it won't pay enough. You're getting zero now. So I'm not really understanding your pride problem. Well, I, I can't go work in fast food. Why not? You're at home and you should be ashamed just sitting at home with nothing. I'd rather have some pride than I went out and tried something. Okay? Well, you know, people might see me. Well, no, you're hiding in your, in your living room, eating bonbons and watching TV and, and crying that you're broke because your ego won't let you go get the job. So you know what? If that one job won't pay you enough, let's say you need to make $25 an hour or $30 an hour, go get two jobs at 15. Wow, that's a lot of work. You know what you gotta do is you have to do. Okay? You wanna, you wanna know what it really looks like? Go start your own business and realize you're gonna work until it gets done. You're gonna work all day, every day, except the Shabbat, you're gonna do what needs to get done. Because you think, you know, well, I can't work two jobs, why not? I used to make a joke, Mike, you could ask my wife, I used to make a joke, I used to go up to her at, at about, you know, six or seven o'clock at night, and say, okay, I'm going to my second job now, but I was still doing the same job. But it was like the second shift, where I was gonna go basically from like eight till three, four in the morning, okay? Or seven until like four in the morning. And then I would get up and start it all over again. And I did that for most of my life. That's what you do when you run a business. You gotta do what you have to do. And if you gotta get two jobs, get two jobs. I mean, I got people all the time telling me I broke the are. I was like, well, what do you do? And they tell me, I said, well, what do you do when you're not doing that? What do you mean? What do you mean, what do I mean? You got a lot of free time. Go work. Oh, you know, I need time to do. Then don't cry to me, okay? Go fix your problem. Anyway, Ollie. Um, yes. Also, you mentioned a lot of serving while doing good well. And okay, wait. Let me, let me, I just want to, I know, I, I said to go, but let me just make this really even stronger. Look at whatever you're doing. If you don't have what you're supposed to have, look at that ego problem, please. Look at that pride problem. Because if you don't have what you need, not what you want, what you need, and that means that you're, there's things you're not willing to do to get it. Because there's nothing out there you can't have if you're willing to work for it. Nothing. You need a new car? Go work for it. You need a better place to live? Go work for it. You need to get out of debt? Go work for it. Okay? Own that you have a e an ego and a pride problem. Own that. Okay? Well, it's beneath me. How could any you out of your mind? Okay? I'm gonna put it like as blunt as I can. If you're home doing nothing for over a year, you're an unemployed loser. Okay? Go work, and then you can be an underemployed successful person. Because at least you're making the effort. But to sit there with your pride and ego, well, you know, I, I'm used to making $40 an hour as a whatever. So go find that job. And if you can't, then accept the reality that you can't. Tool up so you can eventually. In the meantime, go make some money. Pay your bills. You know, 
Some of you don't come to us because you know you should be ashamed of yourself. And you know we're going to smack you. I'm not saying that being broke, you should be ashamed of yourself. Some of you are broke and you have serious, normal, acceptable reasons for that and you need help and that's fine. Some of you don't come because you know you should be embarrassed. And you know we're going to get in your face and say, really? What are you doing? Don't look for me to give you anything when you're not doing what you need to do. Okay? You need to be working and then we're our last resort to fill some gap somewhere. Because I know a bunch of people here that have two jobs, three jobs, and they're doing what has to get done. With children, single, and everything. All right? Okay? I know, you were making a smile, so I wanted to praise you for that. All right? Okay, Ollie, go ahead. I won't interrupt you again. <laughs> because it just frustrates me so much. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. As Yeshua said, my father works and so do I. Absolutely. Exactly. And if you're married, you owe it to your wife. Because you're in covenant with her, you're in covenant with Yahweh. And he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And working is just one of the ways to do it. And we are going to read that verse in this teaching. It's in my notes. Awesome. Go ahead. Awesome. Um, Yeah, also on the topic of serving while doing good well, you mentioned a lot of that. I feel like there should be a steak well done pun inserted somewhere there. I did try. I just mentioned the well done steak, yes. Uh All right. Um, And yeah, just thank you for I just don't want to debate with everybody who says that that ruins the meat. But that's fine. Okay. Next. Uh, um, Yeah, just wanted to appreciate you, the Shamashim, the entire leadership (laughs) around the AV team. You guys are awesome. I love you. An overt beard scratch. That was good. Here you go. What beard? Well, (laughs) what little facial hair you have might turn white now because that's what it does. See, see, one day, one day. This is what it did to me. All right. For everybody watching has no idea what that's about. It's a, go watch The Legend of the Coin. It's a little video on MTY's YouTube channel, and it explains the whole beard scratching nonsense. Okay, Chris. All right. So um, you were looking at the different uh, areas of, of context in Matthew 25, and I looked at the beginning and the end of that. At the end, it kind of just goes right into um, Yeshua and the trial and everything. But the beginning, um, it seems like he's been already talking um, in the whole Matthew 24 part. By the end of Matthew 24, it says, uh, uh, well, I guess in verse 45 would be the most obvious comparison. Who then is a trustworthy and wise servant? Instead of good, good and trustworthy, it's wise and trustworthy. Right. So I guess to be good or to be wise, you should be doing good whom his master set over for his household to give him food in season. Uh, Blessed is that servant whom his master, having come, shall find so doing. Um, And so it seems like this part that he's transitioning into 25 at the end of 24 is like kind of a commentary or this is what you should take out of Matthew 24. And people are always taking Matthew 24 and saying this is you know, what we should be focusing on, but really he spends more time um, explaining what we should be doing because of that um, in 25. And so I really thank you for that, uh, what you were talking about in 25. Okay. And how in um, the last verses of 24, I thought there was elements of almost all the parables in verses 42 through, four, uh, through 51, right. where it talks about um, the trustworthy wise servant it also talks about in verse 49, how you treat your brothers, um, kind of like in the sheep and the goats part in 25. Right. And then um, not knowing when he's coming is, in verse 42, and that would pair up to the uh, oil in the, the maidens right. uh, versions. Sure. So I um, thought that was pretty cool to see um, how, starting with 24. Right, and, then, and so, and look, Yeshua does the same thing that hopefully if you're a teacher and you're going to be a good one, that you would do, which is make a point, then continue to deepen and, and expound on that point. And so he makes the point in 24 a lot of things, and then now he's giving you more pictures and metaphors and, and understanding. So, yes, it's no surprise that you're finding the things in 24 are then continued theme-wise into 25. Yeah. 
Um, I also had a question. So in the evil teaching, it was you're teaching how evil is uh, very often subjective. How dare you call my teaching evil? No. <laughs> it was the name of the teaching. Okay, go ahead. Um, well, so uh, evil is something subjective. It depends on who's doing it and who, who is uh, receiving it. Um, and there are people who call good evil and evil good. So would you say the good can also be subjective in that same way? It, if it's objectively Yahweh's good versus what we think of as good. Well, it's a, it, it, no, you're right there, but I mean, it's not the same as with the evil because with the evil teaching, it was basically the perception and the, and the effect on the one receiving or observing it as opposed to who did it because Yahweh brings plenty of evil. We talked about that in the teaching. But the good is only that, that which is of Yahweh. And when we do it, then we're doing what he does. And so from that perspective, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, and so, you know, kind of kind of keep that thing in mind. Now, when people call good evil and evil good, well, think of all your family members that say that you're wrong and you've, you've lost your salvation because you're trying to keep, keep the Torah. They now called good evil, okay? And that's really, you see that all the time from Christianity, okay? All right, Amy? Um, so in Luke 6, uh, 31, um, when it talks about, um, and as you desire men should do to you, and then to go, um, in my Bible it goes across the column and it goes, the good man brings forth what is good out of the treasure of his heart. And so the other day I was reading Galatians and it says, for if I still pleased men, I should not be a servant of Messiah. So somehow, I don't know how, but it seems like that kind of clicks together. Because well, if I'm worried about pleasing men, like my coworkers or whatever, then I'm not gonna do what's coming out of my heart. Am I pleasing my creator or am I pleasing men? Right. Look, there's a, you're, you hit it completely correctly. Look, there's a lot of stuff in Scripture about when you are split mindedly or split emotionally. And so you can't, in a divided mindset or in a divided heart, accomplish what Yahweh wants you to do. So where your heart is, that's where you're going to follow. And so when your heart is for like you said, like maybe coworkers or this or that, you can be influenced unless your heart is fully on the Father and what he has to say. And so it completely goes back to Deuteronomy 10 and 12 that you gotta love him. Deuteronomy 6, we're talking about loving him with all your heart, with all your might, with all your being. Same thing with the man who loved his possessions. He had a divided heart, divided emotions towards different things, so it was influence. So if I choose to only be influenced by Elohim, you will not influence me no matter who you are, my mother, my father, my best friend, coworker, boss, it doesn't matter, right? You will not influence me because I've chosen to only be influenced by him. So well said. Okay, and um, a Talmud is not above his teacher, but everyone perfected shall be like his teacher. And so I, um, I came across this in Galatians 6, and let him who is instructed in the word shall um, uh, share in all that is good with him who is instructing. Right. So if based on you teaching us and we take that to heart and we apply it and we um, accomplish your goals for us or our goals for ourselves, then we share with you our accomplishments because that encourages you, it encourages you to keep going. Yes, yes. And the Galatians 6 reference I am actually gonna cover towards the very end of this. That's why I was just checking my notes. And when she said, Tal, she said Talmud, not Talmud, Okay, so a, a Talmud is a student, a Talmud is a student. Okay, all right, all right, go ahead. Hello, hey. so I have a question and then like two comments. All right. So my first question is about Matthew twenty five forty. It says, you know, truly I say to you and so far as I did to one of these brothers, you did it to me. So I'm wondering, is it accurate to say that the way you treat others is a reflection of how you treat him? Absolutely. Okay, cool. And so the other day I was talking to some of my Christian friends because when I was in the church, we left when I was 10, so I didn't really get into the whole doctrinal of you know, any, anything. I was still in Bible class. So up until now, I haven't really understood everything you've been saying about them, like what they believe, because I didn't really connect with it. But I talked to my Christian friends at work, 
And I was curious, I was like, so what do you think you have to do to get to heaven, just out of curiosity? And they said, yeah, all you have to do is just believe that he's good, you know, and that's it. You don't have to do anything else. And I kind of understood kind of how you feel because I know that there's a lot of verses that combat that. And I wouldn't have said anything about it, of course. But I was like, I wonder how you feel. Like, you have all this knowledge. Like, that's, I don't know, that kind of sucks. Well, no, look, it's, you have to understand that, for example, um, I could be talking to a three-year-old and there's just a bunch of stuff, or a five or an eight. There's only, at every age level, especially when you're very young, there's only so much that you can understand about something. I have to find the way that you can understand it. And there's certain things you can't understand at all, all right? So when I'm talking to someone who doesn't have their bubble popped, as I would call it, right? So I'm talking to a Christian, they can't understand what I'm talking about. They can't receive it because it's, it needs the above to pop that revelation and, and, and that pop the delusion bubble and give them that revelation. So it doesn't frustrate me. It just frustrates me when they won't allow that we don't agree and they can just leave the subject alone because they want to pursue convincing me they're right. That can be frustrating because I don't want to argue with them. See, some of you may think, oh man, I bet you when rabbi get, I don't argue with people. Okay, I do not. And and if they don't understand, look, there's also verses like do not give your pearls to swine. Okay, don't cast them out there. So I don't try to go into too much with Christians in general because it's never going to get me anywhere because they are already, you know, convinced in their own mind, okay? And there's verses about that too, okay? So a man who's convinced in his own mind, you know, is going to think he's right all the time, even when he's wrong. And so I don't, you know, I get, is it frustrating? Well, it's frustrating to whatever degree, but I guess over the years I've gotten used to the idea that I know I can't get anywhere, so I'm not going to do that, okay? It's funny you said that. I was going to give an example when I was a kid. Um, I feel bad for my parents. When I was like nine years old, I was really stuck on this idea that like I wasn't American because they're not, so I didn't understand the difference between like nationality and citizenship. And you know, just nothing they could say would convince me. So I guess that's kind of how it is for them right, too. Right, right. Look, we are in a world right now, and I guess I'll, I'll be comfortable enough to call it a liberal mindset. You can't convince them of anything, okay? Their mind is closed. There's no convincing them of anything. So when somebody's already you know, convinced in their own mind, don't fight, don't argue. There's nothing you can do. Okay, just say, well, we agree to disagree or whatever, because you can't. As a matter of fact, they are so adamant about not being convinced, they'll talk over you. They won't let you speak. Okay, and so that's because they don't want to be convinced and they don't want to hear it. And that's really, you know, hard to deal with, but that's where we have a world that's very closed-minded, already thinks they know everything. It's like a teenager. Basically, the whole world's a bunch of teen, know-it-all teenagers. You can't tell them anything. They think they know everything. Everybody's wrong but them, and it's hard, okay? Now, I will give you to be somewhat of an exception because you as a teenager come to me and you ask questions and you take counsel. So Valentina, I give you credit for that, okay? Thank you. So yeah, it's like when you say that like, you can't understand some things until like, you keep on teaching about it. Like sometimes it doesn't just click and it's been clicking lately and this teaching, I'm really glad you're redoing it because I definitely wouldn't have understood it if I heard it three years ago. So thank you for that. Amazing. Let me just emphasize that again to all of you. It doesn't really matter your age chronologically, okay? If you hear a teaching when your bubbles first popped and then hear it again three or four years later, you will hear so much more than you weren't able to receive the first time because you can only receive so much when you're just starting a journey, okay? Because essentially you're like an elementary school, school student you know, you're a first grader and you're not going to be able to handle algebra and trigonometry when you're trying to figure out two plus two. But then later when you can do basic math, so to speak, you can do more complex things. Same thing in this walk. You can understand more of the nuances and the, the details. That's why you should go back and listen to teachings you've already listened to after a period of time because you'll get a whole new level of understanding because you're not the same person you were when you listened. The, the teaching's the same, but you're not. All right, Melinda? Yes, I have three quick. Uh, I want to make sure I've got the connections right. Uh, so in Matthew 19, toward the end, uh, talks about those that lose their family or leave their family. Um, I'm going to read what I have here. You may lose things because of your choice to follow him and his commands. This is the cost of discipleship. 
with Messiah. And I connected that with Abram, how Yahweh called him out from his family, his country, his father's house in Genesis 12. Um, and that he may ask you to give up things that you think is good, but he wants what is best for you. Is that a good connection? Really good, the second part where you say, there are things that you think right. are good, right. that he may get you to give up so you can get what he thinks is good. Right. And, and that's, it, that's not easy to do if yeah. you're convinced that what, what, what you're convinced what's good. Yeah, because at okay. first, when I first met you, I wanted to move down here like right away. <laughs> but my father had issues. He had dementia, nobody to take care of him. But then when he wanted to move down here, <laughs> I almost didn't want to. Right. When your husband finally wanted to, then yes. you, yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I had a moment of doubt. Um, but uh, also in Luke chapter six, uh, when it talks about bearing the good fruit versus the bad fruit, uh, I connected that with the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. Yes. Um, and then very briefly, there was like a verse that says, um, uh, I'm your, if you say that I'm your master, why don't you do what I say? Um, and I connected that to James chapter one, verses 22 and 25 about how he tells us to become doers of the word and not hearers deceiving ourselves. And so when we do what he says, kind of like what Yeshua said, if I'm your master, do what I say, which is my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. Look, I want you guys to all pay attention to some of the things that Chris brought up and Ollie brought up and Melinda brought up and some of the others. You could have gone and taken what I just did today and made it even longer by going to all the other references to the references. So they're finding these other connections to really show that this is not just a message in one place, but it's in several places and expand on the point. And we really could take this into a lot more space. I resisted doing that, putting the teaching together and stuck with the original verses from the original teaching, but I'm, I decided to go into more context from there, okay? Otherwise, this will be 100 parts and we're not gonna go there. All right, Linda. Um, thank you. I'm pretty excited today. Uh, I've been thinking a lot lately about I'm on this road and I want to get to that door and I want to hear those words, well done, good and trustworthy servant. And so I've been focusing on the word servant in that and I'm anxious to hear the rest of the story. Yeah. Maybe, the maybe a couple of months that we get yeah, there. Yeah, we'll it'll, there. it'll take a while. So I'm going to be in anxiety until you finish. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll have to hurry a little. But anyway, uh, in Matthew 19, you, re uh, you read to us, and everyone who's left houses, brothers, sister, father, mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and in inherit everlasting life. And I understand that pretty clearly. It's the next verse that isn't clear, and I wondered if you might speak to that. But many who are first shall be last, and the last first. Okay, so I, there's, again, dealing with a certain pride and ego thing. There are people that are going to think, well, I was first, so that somehow benefits me different than those who were last. And you also have the parable of those who are working the field and the people who come later get paid the same as the people who came first. And so he, he's dealing with, in that whole section, again, this idea of having the right attitude and approach. You know, there are people that are thinking, well, we were here, you know, when Yeshua was here himself, and we got, but did you do what he said? Did you understand your position? Others are going to come to it later and really get it, and they will actually be first and you'll be last. So it's not always about, hey, chronologically, I was there before you. It's what did you do with it? Okay. Well, I'm anxious to become that servant, and I'm counting on you to give me all the information I need. <laughs> well, do my best. I'll do my best. All right. And I forgot your name. Daryl. Daryl. Daryl Lawler. Okay. Shabbat good Shalom. To, good to see you again. So my, my situation is I'm just getting out of the Christian church. Bring it I'm right just up. getting out of the Christian church. And I was only told that the old commandments, all the commandments was to do away with, only focus on the Ten Commandments. So I've just been analyzing myself for like the last three or four weeks. I went back to the church compared to why I came here. And when I went in there, it was just like, I don't belong there. I could just see the deception. I don't know how I knew, but I just saw it for the first time. Well, we, time. we call that a bubble pop. 
he has to sort of touch you with that insight. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I'm struggling with, I'm so used to, I guess I got a grain in my mind that once saved, always saved, grace. But then I just read it right here in 16, he was talking about the Father is only good, but he goes down here in 17, keep the commandments. So all week long at work, I've just been challenging myself, like, am I the sheep or am I the goat? My job said we can eat work Saturday. I worked last Saturday and the Saturday before. So I challenged my boss. I said, listen, I can give you any other day, except this day. I'm trying to do something. And he challenged me by basically, I got you this job. Don't disappoint me. So I was just like, well, I can make money. I know how to make money. That's not the problem. The problem I'm having is the most high gives me hand, feet, energy to work. Am I disappointing the job? Because he just got me the job. I know he got me the job. But my thing is, I've been so deceived in these churches, these Christian churches, it's a challenge up here. And my job, I'm about to quit, because I'm thinking, I got to find a job working Monday through Friday. So I'm challenged my, I challenged my boss for the second time. So he said, well, you can go to church, but you need to kill your attitude. So the attitude is, you have the attitude. That's my attitude. Mm -hmm. Because I'm trying to do what's right by the most high, and he was over, he's over everybody. So I know I can find another job. I, I, I have a sports book company. I don't even know why I'm tripping. But, uh, <laughs> I, but I'm just, you know, I'm just, even that, it's like, come out of her for my church. What you mean, come out of her? Well, you chasing money. I'm, I'm trying to chase what's built in me. Like, it just won't go away. It's a passion. I mean. So, if I have this talent, and it's a passion, and you say, come out of her, and, uh, and then on the other half, you want me to come here and just listen to what you have to say, and you don't even make sense anymore because you just don't make sense to me. But, so, like today, I got here. I said, I got to watch the Georgia and Florida game. But somebody just, ugh, I got to get here. So I got here, and then I'm here, and I hear this, keep the commandments. Then I hear 613 commandments, and he told me about it a couple, like a couple weeks ago. I'm at 613. So I've been so deceived on focusing on 10. So what I'm trying to say is, I, it works. I'm glad I'm here for this moment. It works because two weeks ago, I was talking to a homeless man. He didn't have no clothes. So I was like, man, I got plenty of clothes. So I went in my trunk and in my apartment and gave him some of my best stuff. Just gave him to him. And I got him a job. And I know it was me. It just something just took over. Like, here you go, man. I got you. Don't worry about it. But the following week, walking in Volkswagen, I went by the Coca-Cola machine. I just found $100 right there on the ground. I looked around. like, who, who money is it? And I'm like, oh, man. And then I started feeling guilty that I didn't feel guilty. I said, I guess it's mine, so I put it in my pocket. So then I was at Walmart, then $20 just rolled my way. I just, eh, just. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? He's so, funny, isn't he, that way? Right. He's funny that way. Right, so I'm sitting here like, I'm sitting here like, and I'm thanking for my friend Brandy. She said, you in the world, you in between the world. And I go back to my job, like, man, what's she, what's she talking about? I'm in the world, out the world. And I'm mad at her, but I'm mad at myself, because I think she's right. I could be wrong, but I think she's right. And I'm just like, I challenged my boss. I say, hey, man, I'm out of here. Right. So you're my best forklift driver. I said, no, man, I'm going to church on Saturday, whether you like it or not. He said, well, I got you the job. I said, man, I don't want to hear this no more. I don't mean to talk like this. I'm just passionate right now. But anyway. I'm just mad because I've been deceived. I appreciate that. What you, want to, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you don't continue in it. So that's where you should just take that energy and not be mad anymore. Recognize, yes, you were deceived, but now focus on being excited that you now start to see. Okay? Right? Now, now also, also, first of all, I'm very excited for you. Congratulations. For all of you, though, listen, and this is what you can say to your employer if this is true. Because he's going to say something like, well, I got you that job. Maybe that's what they might say. But you need to say, I'm your best forklift driver. 
Do you want to go get another one as good as me? Try it. I think you should give me Saturday off. Otherwise, I can get another job somewhere else doing forklift. See what I'm saying? Value yourself if you are that valuable and use that as your leverage card. Now, of course, if you're just a dime a dozen replaceable worker, then you can't do that. Okay? But if I've always told people, and go back to older teachings, become the most valuable person at that place so that you're not replaceable. Then they will let you have whatever you need, even if they don't let everybody else, because they, they, they have that value from you. Because then you become hard to replace. Let me tell you something. A smart company will recognize how hard it is to get a good employee. And if you are that good, they will bend the rules for you. All right? And so when he said how good you're his best forklift driver, then you look at me and I say, well, then don't lose me. Don't keep focusing on you got me the job. I can go get, his, I can go get a job anywhere. Forklift drivers, I can get a job, especially as good as I am. But do you want me to stay here? Want me to stay here? You got to adjust my shift so I can do it. Because I am your best driver. It won't be easy to get another one as good as me. Use that to your benefit, right? But that's only going to work if you actually are that, right? And by the way, when you say that Brandy, you know, was going back and forth, but I think she's right, but I was this and that, then, so now you get to do that with me. <laughs> you know, that same game, all right? People do that all the time. I don't like what he said, but I think he was right. I don't like what he said, but I think he was right. So you, you, we'll play that game too. <laughs> oh man, it's already so late. All right, quick, some live stream ones if we can. But by the way, we're really excited for you, Daryl. And if you need any help with anything, you just let me know. And we have teachings that cover all those issues you were talking about, like grace, salvation, once saved, all that. We have teachings that fix all that, all right? All right, go ahead. Okay, from Shakara Arnold, Matthew 25, verse 35. Should we be actively seeking opportunities to serve others or just be willing to do it when the opportunity arises? Well, I would say first and foremost, if you have your mindset, you'll end up finding the opportunities more than you had before if you're openly looking for it, all right? And so you should be looking for those moments. Of course, it starts with, to the least of these, my brothers. So some of you will be very quick to help, and I'm glad that he did. He helped that homeless person. But are you looking for people within the congregation that might need some help? Now be careful, though. You don't want to be enabling a bad problem because you may be throwing whatever effort into something that really needs to suffer a little bit and come to the ministry. So best if you actually ask at this point, hey, somebody needs help. I was thinking of helping. What do you think? And we might tell you absolutely go or we might say, no, no, they need to come to us. This is an ongoing problem. There's an ego and pride thing going on and they need to come. Okay. So I would recommend in the context of the, where we are now, be open and look, but then check with us. Now, if something is an obvious emergency, certainly we're talking about then go and do that, right? But if somebody's hungry, we may want to ask the question, why are they hungry? Because you may not be helping the situation by just giving them food. We may need to fix the reason why they're hungry, all right? Which is what we try to do when they call us. We want to figure out what the problem is that caused you to be hungry. Okay, next. Okay, Terry Zimmerman, can you give some examples of bearing false witness? Is that saying you are one thing and doing something different or wearing zit zit and then acting like the nations or does this go deeper? All right, you didn't give a single example of bearing false witness. What you did was give an example of hypocrisy, okay? So you're claiming one thing and you're not. Bearing false witness would be accusing someone and saying, I witnessed this person, but you made it up and it's not true. Okay? So it's bearing false witness against somebody. Now, your witness is false is different than bearing false witness. Okay? So your witness is a false one if you're in hypocrisy. You wear your seat seat and on Saturday you go to work. Or Saturday you go to the store and you're buying things or whatever, right? Okay, so then your witness is a false witness as opposed to bearing false witness. A bearing a false witness would be make lying to get someone else in harm or trouble. Hopefully that helped. Go ahead, next. Okay, from Shakara, Luke 6, 42, does y'all always reveal your planks? Is it possible to not know they're there? 
Um, no, he'll reveal them. Or he'll use people that are close to you to reveal them. The problem is you have to be open to understand that you have a plank while you're busy focusing on a splinter. So again, it's a mindset. Are you, are you open to finding those planks? If you are, he'll show them to you. But maybe not just directly. He might have someone like your best friend show it to you, your spouse show it to you, or somebody you know be like, hey, wait a minute, I think you got an issue here. Okay? Or you may have to come in for counsel. We'll point it out. All right, next. From Monique Edwards. Rabbi, could the different examples we read about be a comparison between immature and mature? Doing the least, not loving, slash taking care of each other, not digging deep for a firm foundation, etc. Absolutely. All right. It takes maturity to do all the things he expects of us. All right, next. From Terry Zimmerman, second question. A bunch of kids in the room want to know how, how you know when, you're, when you love your possessions incorrectly. Being a good and thankful steward versus crossing the line of loving our things too much. All right. Yeah, Terry definitely has a room full of kids. <laughs> um, and we love you, Terry and Chris and all the rest of you guys up there in Alberta. All right, so listen. Um, it's the emotional attachment, meaning how do you feel if somebody were to borrow and not return or borrow and damage or if something happened to your item? How, what's the level of upset? See, being a good steward means you're taking good care of what you have to make sure that if it's something that, you know, is breakable, that you don't break it. If it's something that, you know, isn't that durable, that you do what you can to make sure it lasts longer or whatever it is so you don't wear it out, you know, before it's time. So being a good steward is one level of it. So you're not just careless with your stuff. But things do happen, and if things happen, how, does it, how upset does it make you? Okay? I'll give you, you know, for me... Growing up, boy, when I was probably, you know, 14, 15, or 13, like that, you know, that young teenager range, I think I would have gotten less upset if you punched me in the face than if you broke one of my stuff. That's how much I was attached to my things, okay? So, because I can handle the punch better. You know, you hit me in the face, fine, I might hit you back or not, whatever. But if you broke my thing or you damaged my toy or my, my whatever, my thing, you know, whatever the stuff was, I was... I really had a problem with my stuff, you know? And so I, I broke the habit by just giving as much away. Anytime anybody asked for anything, I just gave it away. I lent it without expecting it back. By the way, that's the best way to go and lend anything. Anything you lend, I don't care if it's a book, I don't care if it's a, an instrument of some sort, like, the, like a, a tool or something like you have. If you lend it to them, you'd like to get it back. But I, I don't lend unless I'm okay not getting it back. Okay, now I don't tell them that so they never give it back, but I'm not gonna get upset, okay? That can happen, or they could break it, or they could damage it in some way, all right? And so I'm not gonna get upset though, otherwise I shouldn't lend it. I shouldn't put, give, put it out there, okay? All right, next. From Adonai's kids, who are considered our brothers and sisters? Is that verse re referring to non-believers as well? In the context here, it's talking about people in the body. Okay? Not that you wouldn't do stuff for people outside the body, but he's got to start you somewhere. So you start with the body and you work your way out. Okay? Okay, from Matt and I's kids again. Shabbat Shalom, Rabbi. How do we measure in a way that allows us to see a brother or sister is sinning without it looking like harsh judgment? Referring to Luke 6, 38. Okay, so Luke 6.38 says, Give, and it shall be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken, um, running over, and all that other stuff. So I don't know how 6.38 has to do with uh, judging other people and their sinning and stuff. You shouldn't be doing that. Uh, it's not your job. You're not qualified to judge someone sinning or not. If you see someone doing something you think may be a problem, as a brother, you may go to them gently, lovingly, and say, I'm a little concerned. This is what I see. It appears to me that this could be something that you may want to do something with or whatever, as opposed to going over and accusing and judging and, and saying, you know, you're sinning type of thing, okay? And if you don't know how to handle it, you ask ministry for help. You ask leadership to give you guidance on how to talk to your brother, okay? Remember, your level of talking to your brother has to do with the level of relationship with your brother because your relationship dictates what you can and can't say appropriately to them. 
okay? You have a very shallow, barely, there's just a casual social relationship with them. You might not be able to do much in terms of helping them correctively. You have a very close brother, sister, whatever, sister, sister, brother, brother, whatever it is, relationship, and you're very, very close that way, you might be able to say almost anything. So it really depends on the relationship. And we need to kind of start wrapping this up. What else you got? Okay, uh, this could be the last one, Rabbi. Greg Wallen, Rabbi Matthew 19, 22. What, quote unquote, stuff can a person be attached to that needs to be sold or gotten rid of to the extent that it causes them to, quote unquote, go away sad, besides that of physical slash material kind? I don't think the verse is talking about things that you should be looking for to figure out that you need to sell. Um, I mean, it's about... Is the stuff you have causing you, if you don't sell it, to not come and follow him? Is it, is it hindering your walk? Those things need to go, all right? And so this person is basically saying, it's like another place where the person, he says, come follow me, and the person says, well, you know, I've got all this stuff. Or, well, you know, my father's getting old and he's gonna die, I need to take care of him. Well, you know, all right. So really, this is the excuse thing. The person wasn't fully following what Yeshua said because he knew he had a lot of things. So he told them with his insight, go sell all your stuff and then come follow me. Because he knew the person had a problem with materialism. And so if you don't have a materialism problem, there's nothing you have to go sell in order to, you know, and maybe something that you might be a little sad when you sell. Some of you have, you know, houses that you know you want to move here and you're going to, if that's what you're going to do, that you may be a little sad leaving where you were. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as you're avoiding being sad is not the motivation that then keeps you from doing what you're supposed to do because you don't want to be sad. That's what the problem was here. The man knew he needed to come and follow Yeshua, but he was making excuses that he didn't want to sell the stuff to do it. And so Yeshua found the line he wouldn't cross. What is your price that you're not willing to pay to follow him? And yet, by the way, Yeshua and the Father both will probably put you in a place where they'll see if you're willing to cross that line or not. Or are you going to draw a line and say, I'm not going beyond this point? Okay, because they need to know that they've got you lock, stock, barrel, and everything. So you can't have anything that's off the table. All right. As a matter of fact, when you do stuff, everything should be off the table that doesn't line up with them. Any relationship you have, any job, any you know, relationship of any sort, any things that you're doing, if it's not of him, you know, it doesn't line up with what he says, then you shouldn't be doing it. It shouldn't even be on the table. All right, that's it. We good? All right, thank you, everyone. Excellent. <laughs>